you're not going to be flipping through your channels one night on the evening news and have some newscaster say, friends, we have a news flash, Jesus came. You're not going to pick up your paper off the front porch and say, what do you know? I must have missed that. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Tonight's subject is uh, one of the most important ones that people ask a lot of questions about, and it's also one of the most confusing ones, dealing with the coming of a cosmic king, and of course you know who that is, talking about the return of the Lord, sometimes referred to as the second coming of Jesus. Now why is this so important? This is referred to as the second coming of Jesus because when Christ came the first time as a baby, that was the first coming. Jesus' people, the Jewish nation, they had scriptures. They had hundreds of prophecies that talked about Jesus' coming. And here's my question. When Jesus came the first time, were his people ready? No, in spite of all the prophecies they had. You see, there's some prophecies in the Bible that talked about when he comes the second time like a lion, but he comes the first time like a lamb. And they got them mixed up. And so when Jesus came quietly as a baby, the only ones who really were ready were some shepherds and some wise men from another country. His own people were amazed when the wise men said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? They said, what are you talking about? And they had been reading the Jewish prophecies, those wise men, probably reading the prophecies of Balaam that you find in the book of Numbers. So if God's people were not ready when he came the first time, could history repeat itself? How do we know that won't happen again? Well, it's going to happen again. A lot of people won't be ready. So we need to find out something more about how he is coming. Let's first establish some foundations. And again, we're going to use our question-answer format. Question number one, can we be positive that Jesus will return to this earth again? Well, he promised he'd come the first time in the Old Testament. And even though it took 4,000 years, he did come. Then he said, I will come again. It's as clear as it can be. You can read it there in John chapter 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I, doesn't say I might, I could, I may. He says, I will come again. Now, I frankly believe what the Lord says. Again, it says in Matthew 26, verse 64, Jesus said to the high priest when he was being tried, Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. The language in the Bible is unmistakable. It's extremely explicit. He said, I will come again. And he not only told us he's coming, he told us something about how he's coming. That's our next question. In what manner will Jesus return the second time? Now, we're going to dedicate a lot to this question tonight. Because I not only want you to know that he is coming back, and we'll give you more evidence tonight. We'll tell you something about when. No man knows the day or the hour, but you can know when it's near. But I especially want to focus on how is he coming. Because Satan is going to seek to impersonate Christ. It will be the masterpiece of the last days. So we need to know something about how he's coming. If you look in the book of Acts, chapter 1, it tells about when Jesus ascended to heaven after his first coming. And it says in verse 9, while they, the apostles, watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Who are these men? Those are angels, you're right. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus that was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. They said he's going to come the same way that he left. Now think about how Jesus left. When Jesus ascended up to heaven, the Bible says the disciples looked at him. He was real. He told them, touch me, feel me. He ate in front of them on several occasions. They saw him. When he comes again, he says, 
I'll be the same way. The angel said he's coming the same way he left. He left in the clouds, he's coming in the clouds. He was visible when he left, he's visible when he comes. He was real when he left, so it was a personal experience. It will be real and personal when he comes. Uh, the reason I say that is some people say, well, Jesus already came. It was a supernatural presence. And not according to the Bible. If you believe the Bible, that'll be very clear that that's a misconception. We need to understand this because Christ warned us very clearly when his disciples asked about his return, there'd be a lot of confusion and deception. Matthew 24, verse 5. We read a little of this last night. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. Many false prophets, many false Christs. And this is what Jesus said next. For there will arise false Christs and false prophets and show great signs and wonders. And, you know, these false prophets often mingle in the Bible with their deception. Jesus said very clearly, Matthew 24, verse 26, Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in secret chambers, believe it not. Now, there are some very shrewd silver-tongued devils out there that claim to come in the name of the Lord and deceive people and exploit people and take advantage of them. But I'm especially worried about when the devil himself puts on his ultimate masquerade. Now, one way that you can know how to discern between the real Jesus when he comes and the counterfeit is how he comes. In the Christian church, there are two principal conflicting views regarding how Jesus is going to come. And I want to go on record right now and say, I'm glad that we got people here from all different backgrounds. Indeed, there are probably some who are agnostic or even atheists here. And you're just coming because you're curious. And I'm glad you're here. I used to be that way. It doesn't matter what your denomination or religion is. I'm thankful that you're here. And I should hasten to add, I think that God has his people in many different Christian persuasions. Did you hear me? I'm not of the belief that only people that happen to be of my particular church are going to heaven. Do you hear that? When it comes to the second coming, the two principal views are this. All Christians, or virtually all Christians, agree just before the end, there is going to be something called the tribulation, a great time of trouble. And some people are wondering, are we on the verge of that now? Because there's a lot of harbingers that seem to indicate that there's going to be a meltdown of some sort before too long. Where the churches disagree is, will Christ come and rapture the saints up before the tribulation, or after the time of trouble. Uh, now, and there's good Christians in both groups. You all hear me? I want you to go by what the Bible says. Does that sound fair? First of all, how many of you have heard of the seven years of tribulation? Okay. Name one scripture that talks about the seven years of tribulation. I'm going out on a limb here. We got cameras rolling and there's over a thousand people here and I'm saying, name a scripture. The reason you're hesitating is because there isn't any. Where does this idea come from of the seven years of tribulation? Well, some people draw it out of Daniel chapter 9. They take the last week off the 490 year prophecy and they stick it down at the end of time and they say, maybe that's it. Or they take the seven days that Noah was in the ark before the flood came and they say, well, let's make those days a year. Maybe that's it. But there's really the phrase seven years of tribulation is not in the Bible. And the idea of the secret rapture basically says people get a second chance. That's exactly what the devil wants people to believe. If you're not ready when the church is raptured, don't worry. You might have to go through the time of trouble, but you get another chance. No, Jesus says you got to be ready now. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. The reformers taught that the tribulation or the rapture takes place after the tribulation and that it is necessary to understand all the books of the um, revelation because they're telling what's going on right up to the end of time. You've heard it said, well, Jesus is coming as a thief. Have you heard that before? And so it's going to be a secret. Church is just going to disappear. Let's read that whole verse. Sometimes people read part of a verse and they don't read on. As we read this verse where it says Jesus comes as a thief, you tell me if you think life goes on on earth for seven more years after the rapture. Here it is, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise 
Sound secret? The elements melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Now, does that sound like anyone's going to have to tap you on the shoulder and say, did you catch that? Jesus came yesterday. <laughs> the whole elements are melting. Great noise. Nothing secret about it. Again, Matthew 24, verse 42. Know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. So when a thief comes, does he usually send an advance notice? I hesitate telling people this, but I used to be a thief. And I was. I mean, I broke into people's houses at night and stole things. I stole cars. I stole TVs. I was a thief. I'm embarrassed to admit that to you. Praise the Lord. That was a different person back then. But, you know, I never sent a, an announcement said, by the way, I'm coming to ransack your house on such and such a day. So when it says a thief came, it simply means it was a surprise. But after I came, they knew. See what I'm saying? Let's go on here. It says, He would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken up. Again, Psalm 50, verse 3, Our God will come and will not keep silence. It will be very tempestuous round about him. Does that sound like a secret? One more. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. It's talking about the voice of a trumpet, Shout again, the Lord will roar from on high. He will utter his voice from his holy habitation. He'll mightily roar upon his habitation. He'll give a shout. All these scriptures are dealing with the second coming of the Lord. Will the second coming of Christ be visible to all men? What does the Bible say? Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, he's coming with the clouds. And how many? Every eye will see him. Someone said, what about those that are in their graves? Well, it's understood. Every eye of everybody alive. Someone else said, well, Pastor Doug, if the world's around, how does every eye see him? It doesn't say every eye sees him simultaneously. As he comes and he goes around the circle of the earth, people are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Who will come with Jesus at the second coming and why? You can read about this in Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him he'll sit on the throne of his glory and again it tells us in verse 31 his angels will gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven so when he comes he's coming with all the angels that's the clouds he's coming in clouds of angels and they're going to gather together those that are ready for his return from all four corners of the heaven means north south east west it means a, it's a universal gathering and again second thessalonians 1 when the lord jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God so at the same time the, re the redeemed those who are prepared are caught up to meet the Lord in glory those same angels are going to be angels of judgment taking vengeance on those who have rejected God and lived selfish sinful lives this is what the Bible teaches friends and I am responsible to tell you the truth I want you to be my friend but even if you're not my friend I'm going to tell you the truth when Christ's resurrection took place, it says one angel rolled away the stone. The glory of that one angel was so awesome that the Roman soldiers were terrified and they fell down as though they were dead and then crawled away in terror. How many angels are there? How many of you have heard about guardian angels? You know, the Bible actually teaches that. Jesus implies that there are angels that watch over people and protect them. How many people in the world? I told you last night. Just about 7 billion now, 6.9 billion. And maybe there's even one recording angel. So one's watching and protecting, one's doing video. See what you're up to. Because everything you do, Jesus said, every idle word you speak, you'll give an account thereof. Those things done in secret, if your sins are not under the blood of the Lamb, it's all going to be in the judgment. What is the purpose of Jesus coming? Why is he coming? We told you in John 14, said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you might be also. He wants you with him. That's why he brought you to these meetings, friends, because he wants you there in the kingdom. He's paid with his life to provide an opportunity for you to live forever because he loves you. He wants you to be there, but he won't force you. We've got two options. We're free. If you choose to reject God and say, I don't want to be part of Christ's kingdom, or I don't want him in my life, 
He gives you that freedom. But if you want to be living forever in his kingdom, then we need to accept him now. Again, Revelation 22, last chapter of the Bible. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works. So he's coming to distribute rewards. Some will be caught up with glorified body, bodies, and others will be judged. And we'll talk about that more another time. What will happen to the righteous people when Jesus comes the second time? It says, the Lord himself, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And then it goes on to say, the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who are alive are caught up to meet the Lord, and they're given glorified new bodies. Those that are in their graves that have died in faith of God, the saved, they're resurrected. And so when the Lord comes, the whole earth is convulsing. There's great noise. There's a resurrection Again, it doesn't sound like a secret. It says the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. Those who are alive are changed at that time. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. That means these bodies that get old and die. And this mortal will put on immortality. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the resurrected in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's what's often called the rapture. It means to be caught up. And so I do believe we will be caught up but it's not a secret. You see the difference? And we don't hang around. There's not life going on for seven more years here on earth after we are caught up. There's destruction and devastation on the planet after the Lord comes. What happens to the wicked people when Jesus comes again? I know this isn't pleasant, but this is what the Bible teaches. It says there in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, Paul said, then shall that wicked one be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And so the wicked are destroyed by the brilliance of his coming. You know, you get a light and moths are attracted to the light. You walk into a room where there's cockroaches, you turn on the light and they run. So everybody's going to be either a moth or a cockroach when Jesus comes. <laughs> and so that's the choice is up to you. Now this is a long verse. Stay with me. Revelation chapter 6 verse 15 and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men it's talking about the worldly leaders and every bond man and every free man they hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and they said to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne for the wrath from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who will be able to stand? I told you a moment ago, the ones who are able to stand are the ones who have a relationship with the Lord. They don't need to be afraid. So how will Christ's second coming affect the earth itself? What's happening globally to the planet when Jesus comes? Revelation 16. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Uh, it's not talking about like the 9.0 magnitude they had there in the South Pacific that shook Indonesia or even the one that just shook America Samoa. They're talking about, you know, a 15 on the Richter scale globally. All the tectonic plates in the world are going to just start to juggle and jiggle and islands are swallowed up according to the Bible. How near is the Lord's second coming? Luke 21 verse 28. He said, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws nigh. Now when it says lift your heads, it doesn't mean go around on your knees lifting. You're getting a crick in your neck doing that. It's talking about having an attitude where your attention is on eternity and not on what you know is temporary. Does everyone here know that life is terminal? Do you all know that? I, did I, I hope I didn't disturb you with that truth. But we're not going to be here forever. The purpose for this life is to determine your eternity. And that's why it's so important that we seek first the kingdom of God. How can I be certain that I'll not be deceived by Satan regarding the second coming? Well, it tells us as lightning shines from the east even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. The brightest light that they knew back then was lightning filling the heavens. Can you imagine one little bolt of lightning, how bright that is? What if the whole sky was as bright as an arc welder? full of lightning. Would anyone have to elbow you and say, did you see that? <laughs> Everybody's going to know when Jesus comes. The brightest light that is known to man was that lightning. 
Again, according to the word, to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. We've got to say, what does the word of God say? And again, in Matthew 24, verse 26, wherefore, as they say unto you, behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. If all of a sudden somebody asked a question last night, why doesn't God appear on TV? It's too small. And that would be a medium that the devil uses. You can hypnotize a person with television using their optic and their auditory nerves. I think people do it all the time. Do you know anyone hypnotized by TV? Yeah, some people get addicted. The idea, I tell you, if Satan was going to impersonate Christ, that's probably the very medium he'd use. So if anyone suddenly appears anywhere in the world and says, yeah, he's, I just heard that he's over now in the desert, go not forth. Don't even look because you are opening yourself up to deception then. Because you know when Jesus comes, do his feet even touch the ground? No, he were come, caught up to meet him in the air. So the coming of the Lord, according to what we've read, it is literal, it is personal, it is visible, it's audible, trumpets like a roar, the ground is shaking, it's physical, it's vitalizing, it's glorious, it's climatic, there's a resurrection. So here's a question. Does that sound like a secret to you? Do you think that all of a sudden you're going to wake up one morning and you're going to yawn and look and all of a sudden your spouse is gone from the bed next to you and, and their pajamas are laying there? I mean, this is, really, this is what people believe. But I tell you, friends, Christians did not believe that 150 years ago. That is a new doctrine that has become very popular. It's very fanciful. It's very colorful. And it's not biblical. If you go by what Christians and the Bible and the Reformers, I mean, what I'm telling you is what Spurgeon believed. It's what Billy Graham used to believe. It's what uh, Luther believed. It's what uh, Wesley believed. Calvin Zwingli, all the great reformers, they believed in the literal coming of the Lord, cataclysmic coming of the Lord after the tribulation. I just want you to be ready. And by the way, what I'm teaching you is safer. See, because if you believe the popular misconception that if you miss the secret rapture, you get seven more years, you got to go through the tribulation, but maybe you'll be converted during that time, uh, it can give you a false sense of security. If, if I'm wrong, and you're ready right now, I'll apologize when we get to heaven. You understand what I'm saying? My theory is not only biblical, it's safer. Be ready now, because when he comes again, that's it. There's no second chance for seven years, friends. Amen? Of what great danger does God solemnly warn us as we enter the last days? He says, therefore, be ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. He wants us to start living in a state of readiness. You don't want to be doing it like you're waiting for the date, the last minute to file your tax returns. I don't know. You guys have tax returns here? Yeah, they're everywhere. That's universal, isn't it? Some people wait until the last day to file. Don't do that with your soul, friends. You don't know if you've got tomorrow, do you? I'm not trying to scare you, but you know that's a fact. You want to be ready now. The Bible says, therefore, since all these things can be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we be in all holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, in which the heavens being on fire will be dissolved and the elements will melt with fervent heat, knowing that all this is going to pass away. Why would you store your treasure down here? My appeal is for you to store your treasure in heaven, friends. Jesus said, behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. We're running out of time. There's only two kinds of people when Jesus comes. One group that's going to run from him and one group that's going to run to him. And they'll declare, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. It says, we'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And everybody here is going to be in one of those two groups. My appeal is for you to say, Lord, I want to be ready. I want to be in that group that's prepared. I want to know you when you come. Virtually all Christians agree that Jesus is coming back, but there's a lot of confusion about how he's coming back. Christ warned us, take heed that no man deceive you. There'll be false Christs and false prophets. So how can we avoid being deceived? Is the Lord coming like lightning shining from the east to the west? or is the rapture going to be a secret? Would you like to know the truth? 
We have a free study we'd like to send you. All you have to do is ask for it. It's called The Secret Rapture, and it explains the whole subject. Go to amazingfacts.org or call the number on your screen and ask for offer number 180. And when you get this free resource, make sure and read it and then share it with someone else because God's message is our mission. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at aftv.org. At aftv.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit aftv.org. Amazing Facts began in 1965 with a God-inspired concept. Hello, this is Joe Cruz on the Amazing Facts broadcast, facts which affect you. Each radio broadcast would begin with an amazing fact from science, nature, or history, followed by a Bible message that touched the hearts of listeners from every walk of life. The program was an instant success, and the ministry soon began expanding to include Bible lessons. In 1986, Amazing Facts added the medium of television to its growing outreach efforts, offering soul-winning evangelistic messages for viewers around the world. In 1994, Pastor Doug Batchelor assumed leadership of the ministry, adding the Bible Answers Live call-in radio program, and new ministry TV programs began airing on multiple networks around the world. For 50 years, the driving vision of Amazing Facts has been the bold proclamation of the everlasting gospel. And with a team of evangelists circling the globe and thousands of men and women being trained through the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism program, AFCO, the ministry is helping God's church see a rich harvest of souls. Amazing Facts, God's message, our mission. Did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham? Okay, maybe he wasn't in the room, but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo. From the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters, enhance your knowledge of the Bible, and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit BibleHistory.com. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. We need men in this day and age where it seems like there's no moral values anymore that'll say, this is the Word of God. I'm not ashamed to say I believe the Word of God in a very secular culture, and I plan on following the Word of God. You can do what you want, but I'm taking a stand. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. You know, I thought as a springboard to our discussion about standing with courage, I want to take you in your Bibles back to a, a book in the beginning, Joshua. And Joshua was the attendant who was with Moses all the way from Egypt through the wilderness, and he had spent so much time studying from the great leader Moses that when the time came for Moses to go to sleep and to die, that he was instructed by the Lord that Joshua was to be your replacement. And in the first chapter of Joshua, verse 5, this challenge is given by God to Joshua. And he makes a promise to him. You're getting ready now to lead the people into the promised land. Joshua was on the borders of the promised land. I don't know about you, but it kind of feels to me like we're on the borders of the promised land again. 
and we need more men who have that courage of Joshua. And the challenge that God gives Joshua is not just meant for that leader, but I believe it's a challenge that applies to every man. He says, first of all, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. That meant that you are going to be victorious in your battle with all of the Canaanites they needed to fight with to take possession of the promised land. They would not be able to stand. In a, in a battle, it's like a boxing match, someone's left standing. That's usually the winner. And in the battle with the devil, you want to be left standing. It's important that we learn how to take a stand and remain standing. There are battles in life. God promised no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Be strong and of good courage. I've got to stop here and just draw attention to a little two-letter word in there. It's be. Whenever God tells us to be something, there is creative power in that word. When God brought the world into existence, He said, let there be light. A leper came to Jesus one day and said, Lord, if you want to, you can cleanse me. And Jesus said, I want to be clean. And He was cleansed from His leprosy. And so when God says, be strong, in the Word of God is empowerment to be what He's asking you to be. So God will never ask you to be something you can't be. Amen. Isn't that encouraging? And in the battles of life, especially today, if you're going to stand, and if you're going to stand with courage, you need to be strong. Because the devil has been sharpening his skills for 6,000 years. Be strong and of good courage. He says, For this people you shall divide an inheritance, the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Now when God emphasizes something twice, that must be important. Saying if you want to take the promised land, if you want to be victorious, you've got to be strong. You've got to be very strong, very courageous. When God says very, that means very. Be very courageous that you may observe to do all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left that you might prosper wherever you go. Now, prosper means be successful. How many men want to be successful? Do you notice the connection he's making here? Standing, courage, strong, successful, law. The key to success and courage is obedience. He gives you courage to obey. I mean, how often did God tell His soldiers to go off into battles that looked like they were hopeless, but He said, I'm with you, so be courageous. And they were victorious because they went into battle with God. Now you realize as we talk about courage and we talk about battles tonight, we talk about being men, we're using the metaphors of war in the Bible. You know, I, I really love the way that our producers surrounded the stage here. That, that's a very interesting piece back there, the armor of God. And that sword here, if anyone tries to rush the stage, that, I'm ready, this is real. <laughs> and so these are, you know, some of the, um, the symbols we think of in war. And uh, that's because there is a war. There are battles in life. And we need to know how to win those battles. Be strong. There's a command here to be strong. This is now, you notice this? Be strong and of good courage. So there you've got it three times. Be strong of good courage. Be strong and very courageous. Be strong of good courage and you will have great success. You know, God is promising that to you and I and because the very fact He's saying be that means you can be that. Now that ought to encourage you. Amen? So what is courage? God's telling us to be something. What is it? Courage is the state or quality of mind or spirit that enables one to face danger, fear, or vicissitudes with self-possession, confidence, and resolution, bravery. You need all that not only to fight battles on a battlefield, you need all of that to fight spiritual battles with the enemy. We need courage. Now this series is titled Mighty Men of God. And uh, that of course comes from a, a title, a phrase that was given to this 
interesting group of special forces that belonged to King David. David and his mighty men. And as a matter of fact, the phrase mighty men is found 71 times in the Bible. And uh, David had 37 mighty men. You can read the lists of them in uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel, and in Chronicles. You'll find it 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles 11. And you look at the exploits and you think, this can't be true. This is like superheroes, the things that these guys did. Now, on several occasions to talk about one or another of David's mighty men that it says killed 300 enemy in a battle. How do you do that? I mean, that's like Samson who says with a thousand, with a jawbone of a donkey, he slew a thousand men. And I challenge you to find one time, you know, the name David is mentioned over a thousand times in the Bible, more than the name Jesus. You can't find one time when David's soldiers lost a battle. Wouldn't you like to be part of that group of mighty men? You know, one of them in particular is kind of a, a, a real interesting subject for me. I don't have time to read through all 37 of David's mighty men. I will just tell you that uh, one of them was named Uriah the Hittite. We'll talk about him in a later meeting. But there's this other character, and you can find the story of this one particular battle that really went down in Hebrew history. 2 Samuel 23, 9. You'll also find it in 1 Chronicles 11. I'm going to read first, 2 Samuel 23, 9. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Yehohite, who was one of the three mighty men with David. And not only did David have 37 mighty men, he had like the top three among the 37. And Eliezer was in that group. And it says, they, def they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel retreated. They were on the battlefield. Some of them got discouraged. They were outnumbered. You know, there's only 400 of them. And maybe there were thousands of Philistines, and they all began to fall back and retreat. But it says, he arose, Eliezer, and he attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand stuck to the sword. That means he, he held the sword. I've got to be careful with this. This is a real sword here, but I think it was duct tape holding it up. You're a man. You can do anything with duct tape, right? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> he held on to it so long in fighting that when the battle was over, he couldn't undo his hand. Now, that actually happens. Have you ever ridden, I see Wayne here, you ever ridden a motorcycle on a cold day for so long that when you get to your destination, you can't open your hand? Yeah. <laughs> I see you all nodding recognition. He got in this battle, and he was cutting and slashing and fighting. Let me read it to you here in Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 11, 12 through 14. After him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, who was one of the three mighty men. He was with David. And this adds something else. They all retreated except he and who? He and David. Eliezer and David stayed when everyone else ran. He was with David at Pasadamon, and there the Philistines were gathered for battle, and there was a piece of barley ground. So the people fled. The Israelites fled from the Philistines, but they... David and Eliezer stationed themselves. You know what that means? They took a stand. Everyone else is running? They said, we're not running. We're staying right where we're at. Kind of remembers, reminds me of that time in American history when the English were attacking the American Navy. And I think the Navy consisted of one boat back then. They called it our Navy. And uh, what was his name? John Paul Jones? And they said... I think they were on a ship called the Bahanami Richard. And they said uh, yeah, the ship was on fire and it looked like it was, uh, had been shot up by cannon. And the British officer said to uh, Captain Jones, he said, uh, do you surrender? You know what he said? Surrender? We haven't even begun to fight. <laughs> and at that point, one of his men threw a grenade in a porthole of the British ship and it blew up. And they ended up winning the battle. And, you know, David said, retreat. Well, I'm not retreating. His whole army left him, but he stayed. And he and Eliezer fought back to back, and they were going around, they must have been like in a big sword, just going around like a, a weed eater through the Philistines, <laughs> and just mowing them down with their swords. They took their stand. You know, we need more men to take a stand today. Amen. We're not defending barley fields. What is what does grain represent in Bible symbols? Man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word. They took a stand in the field of grain. 
and they're going to lay down their lives for it. And we need men in this day and age where it seems like there's no moral values anymore that'll say, this is the Word of God. I'm not ashamed to say I believe the Word of God in a very secular culture, and I plan on following the Word of God. You can do what you want, but I'm taking a stand. That's how you become a mighty man of God. And you know what God says? You do that, you will be successful. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And there they were, David and Eliezer, back to back, fighting. You know, Jesus is called the son of David. And if you go into battle with Christ, you don't lose. And Jesus has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Amen? Amen? Right. He is the son of David. And it says, so the Lord, they, they defended it and they killed the Philistines and so the Lord brought about a great victory, an extraordinary victory that day because they wouldn't run. You know, sometimes it's, uh, it's helpful when you take a stand. Sometimes you need to do it alone. It's really helpful if you've got friends that will help you take a stand for what's right. You know, in order to be a successful Christian mighty man in this day and age, it's really valuable for you to have some men friends that you can be open with, that you can trust, that you can be honest with, that you know that what you talk to them about and when you pray with them, it stays between you. And you can hold each other accountable. When Jesus sent out the apostles, you know, so he didn't send them one by one. He sent them out two by two. And the Bible says in a three braided rope is not easily broken. If you've got two or three, you're even stronger. When the missionaries went out, it was Paul and Barnabas and Mark or Paul and Silas or Aquila and Priscilla and Paul. And then they would strengthen each other as they went out. Do you have some friends? A lot of men are easily overcome and they get discouraged because they don't really have a Christian friend they can disciple with and they can be open to. And it's a good idea for those who maybe are a little more mature in their walk to maybe take a, a slightly younger man and, and mentor them and be like a big brother and encourage them in the Lord. This was a plan that they had in the Bible. You know, Peter was a little older than John. But they were a team. You notice they always went out two by two doing things. The Bible talks about three friends that had become so close that they were ready to die together. You go to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, and you've got, you know their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sounds like the names you'd find on some law firm or something. <laughs> now they had other names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a lot more fun to say, don't you think? Those were their Babylonian names. But the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he makes a law, and the law basically says that everybody, when they hear the signal music, the orchestra plays, they're all supposed to bow down, get down on their knees, worship this man-made image. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar said, I made a god. I want you to worship it. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a problem. God's word, the law that God talked to Joshua about, it said, you will not make graven images and bow down and pray to them. And they had to make a decision. They were brought to this event. Maybe they didn't know what was going on at first and there's thousands gathered on the plain of Dura and it was probably impressive. You know, they had uh, some special guests that were there and they had all the leaders from around the realm and people are wearing their uniforms and their royal robes and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thinking, wow, just a little while back we were slaves coming from Judea and here we are with the, uh, the who's who of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and it's kind of nice to be in this crowd and then they hear what, what the party's all about. They're supposed to bow and worship an image. And they read the program and they looked at each other and they said, um, we can't do that. But it says here, if you don't, fine print, oh, by the way, uh, those who don't, you're going to be thrown in the furnace not far away where they smelted the gold. And I'll bet they had some discussion among themselves. And they said, brother, you know, God's taken care of us this far. He brought us to these positions of influence. Perhaps this is the time for us to use our influence to die for His name. Perhaps He'll deliver us. We don't know what He's got planned, but all we do know is God said, do not bow down to images. We can't do it. Yeah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo saw everyone else bowing down. They looked at each other and they folded their arms and they stood. They had the courage to stand when everyone else bowed down. 
Makes it a little easier when you're standing with someone else, right? And you know the story. Finally, when word reached the king, he said, look, I, I, like, I like you guys, you know, and you've, you've been good in the court, and I've been in, impressed, and I tested you once, and you were ten times wiser than everybody else. I'd rather not kill you, but maybe you didn't hear clearly, because you, you know, originally come from another language, and Babylonian Chaldeans, your second tongue, and let me make this clear, I'll give you one more chance. The devil would much rather have you compromise. You hear the music, and they could have said, well, maybe we should think this through, you know? Uh, uh, King, is it okay if when you play the music we just tie our sandals? We won't bow to the image, we'll just, we'll just tie our sandals so we'll look like we're you know, going along, we don't want to ruin your party, and couldn't they have done that? They wouldn't even compromise. They said, no, we're going to stand. We're not even going to look like we're doing what everyone else is doing. Amen. And you're going to be mocked, and you're going to be ridiculed, and your job might be threatened, and your status might be threatened, and promotions might be threatened. For them, their lives were going to be threatened. But they decided to stand. And the king said, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. And one of them said, uh, we don't want to be careful in answering you on this matter. You don't have to play the music again. We're not going to bow down. And if our God wants to, He's able to deliver us. If He wants to. You know what that means? If He doesn't, He doesn't. I remember visiting with a um, very dedicated Christian gentleman who had uh, serious uh, advanced cancer. And he said, Doug, I have peace. He says, I know God can heal me, and I appreciate your prayers, but if He doesn't, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if He does, great, I know He can. If He doesn't, I accept that too. My responsibility is to obey God. Amen. My responsibility is to be faithful. You know, all of us, if you're faithful to God, you are going to have an opportunity to stand. It might be when people are talking about things that are unsavory around a cubicle in an office and you don't laugh at the joke because you know this isn't what the Lord wants. But when you stand, others, they'll look at you and some might jeer and some might scoff, but for God's mighty men, it's more important what God thinks of you than what the world thinks of you. You know, several years ago, I was pastoring a little church, and um, one of my deacons elbowed me, and he said, you know who that is? And uh, I said, no, and he pointed to an old couple that was making their way up to the front of the church. He said, that's a Desmond Doss, you know, the war hero, got the C Congressional Medal of Honor. And I was really excited because our family had just read the book together. Uh, ended up his... Um, his wife, Francis, had family that were members of our church, and so we got to know each other. And then he'd come to Sacramento, saw him different places when I preached back in uh, Tennessee. And just an incredible man. I don't know if you've heard the story, but uh, a dedicated Seventh-day Adventist Christian who actually volunteered during World War II in 1942 as a conscientious objector. He says, I want to help. I want to do my part. I'm thankful for our freedoms but I'm not going to take up a gun and uh, hurt anybody. I'll be a medic. And you know, the recruiters, they'll say, sure, sure, no problem, whatever you want. I don't know if any of you have been in the service, but recruiters will promise you the moon. And you say, you know, yeah, and I want to fly a jet. Sure, no problem. <laughs> and you end up cleaning the latrine. <laughs> and they say, yeah, no gun? Yeah, no problem. So he signed up. And uh, finally when his officers, even the medics, had to carry a weapon. And when they found out that, first of all, he said, I won't do any unnecessary work on Sabbath. And the recruiter said, oh, uh, yeah, no problem. And they said, yeah, that is a problem. When he finally joined, he said, well, I can't do it. And they threatened him, and they put him in the brig, and they, they made him peel to potatoes and clean the latrine, and, they, and he said, I'm not going to carry a gun. Can you imagine that? And the other soldier said, you mean you won't defend me? When I'm on the battlefield, I can't count on you because you're not going to be able to defend me and he was ostracized and he was ridiculed and they gave him a very hard time but he stood for his convictions. You know, to be a Christian man doesn't mean you've got big muscles. To be a mighty man of God, it never says that the guys who are David's mighty men were muscular. But they had conviction and they'd followed David. The Bible says David was handsome. Never said he was buff. Did you know that? 
So Dawes stood for his convictions. Finally, they got on the battlefield and they found out what he was really made of. He had an inner strength. And some of the people that were big mouths on the battlefield ran when the bullets started to fly, but not Doss. And I want to just read you the citation that was given to him. And this is actually, this was issued by the government back when he received his medal. It says, he was in a company, he was a company aid man, a medic, when the 1st Battalion assaulted a jagged escarpment it has made a movie about this called Hacksaw Ridge, 400 feet high. As troops gained the summit, a heavy concentration of artillery, mortar, and machine gun fire crashed in, afflicting approximately 75 casualties and driving others back. PFC private, first class, DOS, they would never promote him, refused to seek cover and remained in a fire-swept area, I mean swept by enemy fire, a blizzard of bullets, and he refused to seek cover with the stricken carrying all 75 casualties one by one to the edge of the escarpment and lowering them on a rope supported leader down the face of a cliff to friendly hands. On May 2nd he exposed himself to heavy rifle and mortar fire in rescuing the wounded, a wounded man 200 yards forward of the enemy line. On the same escarpment two days later he treated four men who had been cut down while assaulting a strongly defended cave advancing through a shower of grenades to within eight yards of enemy forces in a cave's mouth where he dressed his comrades wounds before making four separate trips under constant fire to evacuate them to sa safety. On May 5th, those who reported later when he got his medal said this was supernatural. He had something taking care of him because there was a withering blizzard of bullets going all around him and they didn't hit him. You stand up for God, He'll stand up for you. May 5th, he unhesitatingly braved enemy shelling and small arms to assist an artillery officer. He applied bandages and moved his patient to a spot that offered protection from small arms fire. While artillery and mortar shells fell close by, painstakingly administering plasma. Later that day, when an American was severely wounded by fire from a cave, PFC Doss crawled to him where he had fallen 25 feet from the enemy position, rendered him aid, carried him a hundred yards, that's a football field, to safety, he was my size, while constantly exposed to enemy fire. On May 29, uh, 21 in a night attack on high ground near Surrey, he remained in exposed territory while the rest of the company took cover, fearlessly risking the chance that he would be mistaken for an enemy. Incredible courage. Now, do you think any of the other soldiers teased him after that? They gave him the highest medal that can be awarded an American for bravery because he stood for his convictions. And our time together this weekend when we're talking about what it means to stand with courage, we're not talking about military battles, we're talking about standing in a culture where Christians are under attack. And I just wonder as we close, how many of you want to say, by God's grace, I want to be one of his mighty men that will stand for the right though the heavens fall? Hello friends, I want to tell you about an extraordinary opportunity for you to share your faith. I expect that you've heard by now that Hollywood has just released a blockbuster movie called Hacksaw Ridge. It's about a World War II hero named Desmond Doss who was a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. He was terribly persecuted because he refused to carry a gun. He said, I'm entering the war to save life. And even though they accused him of being a coward, during the Battle of Okinawa, he single-handedly rescued 75 men that were trapped up on this bluff called Hacksaw Ridge. He was given the highest honor that America can offer, the Medal of Honor. And the very fact that the world is going to be focusing their attention on a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and his convictions is a tremendous opportunity for us to witness about our faith. Because of that, Amazing Facts in partnership with Remnant Publications has just produced a new book called The Hero of Hacksaw Ridge. It is the authorized biography of Desmond Doss, except there's something special. In the back of the book, we have a section written about the faith of the man. What did Desmond Doss believe? So friends, now, while the movie is in the headlines and people are talking about who Seventh-day Adventists are, please order these books right away, share them with your friends, and you can change lives for eternity. To get your free copy today, please call the number on the screen and ask for offer number 821. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at aftv.org. 
At AFTV.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.org. Let's face it, it's not always easy to understand everything you read in the Bible. With over 700,000 words contained in 66 books, the Bible can generate a lot of questions. To get biblical, straightforward answers, call into Bible Answers Live, a live nationwide call-in radio program where you can talk to Pastor Doug Batchelor and ask him your most difficult Bible questions. For times and stations in your area or to listen to answers online, visit bal.amazingfacts.org. Together, we have spread the gospel much farther than ever before. Thank you for your support.